Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It was interesting to hear a, a little bit of insight into what may have happened with regards to this manifesto leak. Um, a lot of people would have had access to this document, this 43-page document, which I think, um, and obviously I'm, I'm sort of groping around in the dark a little bit myself on this one as well, but I don't think anybody is claiming it would definitely have been the final draft, the finished article, so to speak. You have this so-called Clause 5 meeting later today um, at which things would be finalised. I, I think I heard Theo Ushwood, our political editor, suggesting earlier that some people are even uh, putting forward uh, the, the, the notion that Jeremy Corbyn might have been sort of pleased with the leak himself because it strengthens his hand going into these meetings given that the you know his bigger ambitions for the manifesto are now out there so let's look at those bigger ambitions energy firms railways and royal mail to be re-nationalized uh, the detail of course will no doubt reveal the devil but it would i imagine involve waiting for the established franchises to come to an end and then returning the rolling stock and the and the roots to national ownership. I think this is fascinating, nationalisation. I, I really do. Of all the sort of tribal binary positions, this was one of the very first, and it all dates back to the 1970s and the fact that the lights went out. I remember sitting in, in on Hercot Road in Kidderminster, oddly enough, a few doors up from where, where Tom Watson would have been doing his homework, and doing my homework by candlelight. That And that would have been pre... That would have been pre-79, wouldn't it? But genuinely sitting there doing doing my homework by candlelight in the dining room, the dining room, dining table of our house in Kidderminster. And as a kid, obviously, you sort of look back on that with a, with a degree of romance or excitement. I remember news footage, although you can never really be sure what you've seen subsequently as a sort of retrospective roundup and what you actually remember from from the contemporaneous news reports. I, but I, I, I'm pretty sure I remember television footage of rubbish piled high in public places and and that was the if you like the apotheosis of nationalized industry so if you're like 45 years old there you, you just just remember the 70s anybody older than that is going to have a much clearer recall on these issues but oddly they don't all pick a side they don't all conclude that as a result of that winter of discontent as a result of those industrial actions those figures like red robbo and arthur scargill whose reputations were writ large in the public consciousness it hasn't necessarily killed off the notion of nationalization forever Clearly, because Jeremy Corbyn is, is older than me, and he thinks it would be a great idea to bring it back. You remember jokes probably about British Railway sandwiches and about how, however bad things might be under a privatised uh, management, they were considerably worse under a public one. And, and I, I kind of nodded along with that historically. Just sort of went, went, it was almost an unchallenged narrative, wasn't it? And then, of course, we all got the chance to buy shares. I tell Sid. British gas, you could buy shares and stuff. Everybody, the idea was everybody would become a stakeholder. I don't know if anyone's done any research now into where all those shares ended up, but I suspect they ended up ultimately in the same place that all the other shares ended up pre-nationalisation. They'll be with the with the heavy institutional investors and the like. But but the the country owned those assets and subsequent governments raised money by selling the assets essentially back to the country. The point at which I stop nodding along is when people point out to me that other governments now have significant stakes in previously public sector infrastructure in this country. So off the top of my head, the French government has a serious exposure to Peugeot car company, doesn't it own a fat slice of Peugeot? It also owns energy companies or has significant shareholdings in energy companies that operate in the United Kingdom. And I'm pretty sure that some of the franchises on what used to be British Rail are owned by uh, groups that contain government investment and government involvement from foreign countries. So it's a very good line. It's a, it's a lovely political joke to say that the government in Britain is, oppo is, is not opposed to the state ownership of public unity, utilities as long as it's foreign states doing the ownership. But that should give everybody pause. Because if you've got something that is making a profit, if it belongs to the government, that profit goes into the treasury. 
if it is, belongs to the private sector, that profit goes in to the pockets of investors and shareholders. Now, of course, conversely, if it makes a loss, that loss must be covered by the Treasury. That loss must be covered by public spending. Um, and in the private sector, if, if a company makes a loss, the shareholders don't get their dividends, they don't get their, their payouts, they don't see their share price rise. But why? What's the question I want to ask you? With reference to this draft manifesto, somewhat embarrassingly leaked today, is, is, is there, is there a, a case for suggesting that we need to be a little less scorched earth about nationalisation and renationalisation? Don't forget that Theresa May's energy cap essentially swims against free market economics that conservatives are traditionally supposed to uphold, interfering in the market, not letting prices set themselves according to supply and demand, but actually stating, no, there is an upper limit here. That's that state intervention. That, that is not laissez-faire economics. And the ultimate incarnation of state intervention is state ownership. And in this case, it would be state re-ownership, re-nationalisation. Energy firms, railways, Royal Mail. What's not to like? 0345 uh, A few of you are a little bit unhappy at the number of questions that Sadiq Khan had to field with regard to immigration. You're suggesting that this is a rare corner of the British media that recognises that is not the single exclusive defining feature of our times. But, hey, you know, you make a valid point, but we deal with the questions that pop up on the board, and, that, and that's what all the politicians who come into these studios will be doing. 10.52 is the time. Um, nationalisation is the conversation. It's in the Labour Party manifesto, or, or, or whatever the manifesto ends up looking like. We've all seen a first draft or read reports, heard reports of that first draft, 43-page document that somebody leaked to the media. Renationalisation of railways, energy companies and the Royal Mail is, is top of the list. And I, and I love this as a, as a conversation you and I can have together because well, why is it a dirty word in British politics, and, and should it remain one? Alex is in Warwickshire. Alex, what would you like to say? Hello. Um, I'd like to see the renationalisation of the railways, and I believe that having a uh, public sector energy company in each of the regions of the UK is a fantastic idea. I mean, the, the point in evidence is the fact that the East Coast Main Line uh, last year got brought, taken out again into private hands. Uh, the franchise was given out purely based on ideological reasons. The, uh, ideological uh, reasons being a belief that privatisation is preferable to, to any form of national Being ownership. a belief that the market um, that market capitalism rules all, when in fact, the fact even Adam Smith says himself that that, that, capitalized, um, that capitalism needs having checks and balances. The East Coast Main Line customer satisfaction went up um, up to the levels of Chiltern Railways, who are, you know, the stalwarts of... This is while it was being run, essentially, by government-appointed management. By government-appointed management, a quango. So, it, so it was it was a nationalised route of sorts for a period of time under which it was both efficient and profitable. So, do you understand? I mean, ideological reasons is a bit of a get-out. Um, although it may be the only one we can find, why would a government give a private company a profit-making business when it could have kept it running it themselves and kept the profits? Um, because somebody, uh, for instance, like Richard Branson, takes the government to court when they don't give them the franchise and they keep it within themselves. I mean, East Coast Mainline made almost a billion pounds for the Treasury. And you say about um, hmm? private uh, private companies when they make a loss, um, the shareholders have to stomach it. Whereas with the railways, it almost uh, it, it, it's unbalanced because even when the railways make a loss, the government still have to subsidise those private franchises when they make a loss because they can't just close a route or sack sack staff as as, as exactly and more ex less exposed companies either. do. How old are you? Do you mind me asking? I'm 27. Because you, you, so you're 18 years younger than me. You, you, have, do you, you don't feel I sense that you've grown up in a climate where nationalisation is a dirty word. Um, I I feel like I have grown up right. in a climate where it is. I think that uh, basic services such as social housing, basic services such as energy, such as transport, infrastructure of the, the country that private companies rely on for the workers to... And education that private companies rely on for the state to provide them with educated people, people transported to work, people to heat their homes, should be provided by the government... Um, via high taxes on 
uh, high corporation taxes, exactly the way that Corbyn... I, I joined the Labour Party uh, because of Jeremy Corbyn, because he's probably the first person who I actually believe that I trust and who is a principled man who has been on the right side of history for the last 30 years. But well, okay. Well, I mean, that's that, that. That's your view. I'm not here to pick over your reasons for for liking Jeremy Corbyn. I'm more interested in your reasons for liking nationalisation. And and the the reason I was interested in your age is that you may have grown up with it being something of a dirty word, but you haven't grown up in the shadow of the the, the strikes. It was '76, I think, when the rubbish started piling up in the streets and the railways were the were the shame of Europe. And arguably, the energy companies were hemorrhaging money. My father's worked for, well, for what was British Rail from when he was 16 and he's still at now Chiltern Railways and has seen it go through um, being nationalised, uh, being in national hands and then being privatised and now it's so broken up and segmented out that yes. he feels that it's a little bit, while might be too far gone to renationalise, actually by taking franchise back in as they come up Peace again, mail. you can actually start doing it and as a process, it's not as if, you know, on June the 9th, Jeremy Corbyn, when he wins, is going to just completely buy all the franchises back in. It is a process over the next five years. It's a, well, actually, you describe it bring them up. in those ways. If, 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 if we can take what we've seen of the leaked manifesto draft as, as close to the truth, then it would actually be a sort of slow reversal of the slow process of, of privatisation. So you got, you well, there you go, 1-0. 28 years old, um, and by no means spooked at the very mention of nationalisation. I, I grew up spooked at it, but I'll tell you what's changed my mind. It's the fact that other state-owned companies are running our public sector, previously public sector infrastructure, and making lots of money out of it. I, this stuff, for me, and I know I'm just a naive old soul, but for me, this is the stuff that actually would shift the debate. If, if, if it was put out there all the time that a, that a Dutch-controlled uh, company, state-owned company, Abellio, state-owned by, by Holland, uh, Greater Anglia, Northern, ScotRail, Mersey Rail, bus services across London and the UK, and they took £20 million out of this country. That's £20 million that essentially makes its way into the Dutch Treasury because of British customers. Why? Because there's something abroad in Britain that says governments can't run companies. Keolis UK, um, uh, French controlled, dividend withdrawn in the last two years, £37.9 million. They have interest in the Docklands Light Railway, the Gatwick Express, London Midlands, Southern, South Eastern, Thameslink, Great Northern, Trans Pennine. So the con, such as it is, of, of, of traditional a conservative rhetoric on this issue would be that state ownership of private sector companies doesn't work. Except, well, Arriva, German-owned, dividend within the last two years, 15 million quid. And as Alex's dad will know, they've got an interest in Chiltern Railways, Cross Country, Grand Central, London Overground, Wales and Borders. So really the question should probably be if foreign, if state-owned foreign companies can make a killing on what used to be public sector infrastructure in Britain, if state-owned foreign companies can make a killing on the British railways, why can't state-owned British companies <laughs> make a killing on the British railways? Now, even if you're a sort of chomping Thatcherite, you're going to have to nod at that. You can, yeah, all right, well, if the French government or the German government or the Dutch government or, or, or even the Hong Kong government, in the case of... Uh, uh, a company called MTR a few years ago, if they can all take millions, in total hundreds of millions of pounds, out of our previously public sector companies, whether in energy or, or railways, or Corbyn wants to put the Royal Mail on the list as well, why can't state-owned British companies? My phones are full at the moment, but try to answer that next. It is supposed to be a dirty word. The Daily Mail has piled straight in by suggesting that this leaked Labour manifesto will take us back to the 1970s. Um, if only there was a sort of mass market tabloid that, that, that set up both sides, that, that didn't toe a line from either side. Because then you'd arguably, you'd be looking at, you're looking at rhetoric now that one side says the other lot want to take us back to the 1970s and that lot say the other lot want to take us back to the 1950s. What decade do you want to live in is the question that underpins the 2017 general election. The 1950s or the 1970s? Problem is with the 1970s analogy is, is that's when the wheels came off. That's when arguably union power had become too strong and the egos of some of the leaders involved, the ideologies blinded them to the pragmatic realities and as a result we, we have those still uh, well remembered scenes of, of uh, stasis and, and rubbish piling up in public spaces. But public ownership prior to the wheels coming off 
is not historically regarded as problematical. And for me at least, and, and, and I don't often say this, but I don't think there is a response to this argument. I genuinely don't. It, it just doesn't get reported enough. The, the, the state-owned foreign companies that are running huge swathes of our railways use the money they raise to cut ticket prices for their own passengers back home because that is electorally attractive. We have brought down ticket price. How have you brought down ticket price? Well, we own the London to Birmingham line. We just tripled the fares on that. So, so we brought down the Dusseldorf to Cologne line. Do you see? I'm being simplistic, but I, I look at politics now and think, why, why, have, why have one side got a kind of monopoly on all the, all the scaremongering? And it's because detail isn't sexy. Detail isn't a ticket for the ghost train. You need to find stuff that isn't that detailed, but which appeals to similar senses of self-interest. Can I play you an advert? Shall I do this? Because I, I, I think this is astonishing. This is actually a British advert. It's from the Transport Salaried Staffs Association. Um, that is a union for people in transport and travel. And I've already given you some of the numbers. George and Aberfoyle will be up next, then William and Finchley. But just listen to this. The people of the Netherlands. The people of France. The people of Germany. Want to thank the British people. Because you've privatized railways. Our publicly owned rail networks can buy your rail network. So when you buy a ticket on Thameslink, Gatwick Express, Grand Central, Children's Railways, on Mercy Rail, Scott Rail, Greater Anglia, London Midlands, DLR, London Rail, London Overground, and Cross Country. Southern and Southeastern. The profits go to making our railways cheaper. So it's a two-minute advert. You can watch the whole thing if you follow me on Twitter. Thanks to Sam who sent it in to me. That's, I love that. One of many, many things. Sorry to go on about it, but I, I mean, that's amazing. Someone's tweeted me something I've never seen before. We're playing out on the radio within two and a half minutes flat. Now, you won't get this anywhere else. And it's, it's why the conversation sometimes seems to move unexpectedly. Why is nationalisation a dirty word? Given that all of those examples are true. State-owned companies running British railway lines and using the profits that they make to cut ticket prices back home. You know how I feel about racist rhetoric with regard to immigration or refugees or whatever it may be. But the national interest, actually, this is devoid of racism. This is defending the national interest in the most pure and simple of ways by saying money raised in Britain from passengers and journeys made in Britain arguably should stay in Britain. I don't really mind whether the foreign investor is a foreign government or a foreign bank, but if it's a foreign government and they're using the money they get from the Anglia line to cut prices on the German line, we're just mugs and everyone's still cross about some Polish plasterer. It's, it, it, this is brilliant, isn't it? This is why the pledge is still there, probably. Because as long as you keep immigration on the table, you can carry on picking the pockets of the British people. This is, this is, this is huge, right? In terms of reason and detail, and meaningfulness. Jeremy Corbyn is already taking a kicking from the newspaper, the Daily Telegraph, that's owned by a couple of secretive billionaires based on one of the Channel Islands, taking a kicking from the Daily Mail, which is registered in Bermuda and, 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 and owned by someone who's registered as a non-dom. It's taking a kicking from The Sun, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch. Oh, nationalisation, down with it, down with it. I don't know whether it's good or bad, but I don't think anybody, I wish I had more phone lines free, can we just biff a couple of calls if somebody actually wants to argue with me and say it's a good thing thing that profits raised on British rail routes go to German, Dutch and French treasuries. And now you should feel a bit silly if you're one of the people that routinely chomps at the bit with regard to immigration if you buy the ticket for that ghost train every single day because yet again it's been proved that you're punching yourself in the face and barking at completely the wrong moon. But I'm probably wasting my breath. George is in Aberfoyle. George, what's going on? Morning, James. Uh, right. This is a subject that really lights my blue touch paper, I must admit. And um, over my adult life, I've experienced a complete U-turn away from complete favouring of privatisation to realising that actually nas nationalisation is, is crucial here. Uh, I'm, I turned 50 this year, so I saw, yes. I, I've been through the, you know, the tail end of the strikes and then the, through the whole Thatcher privatisation of all industries. I took part in the, the share flotations, made a few quid from British Gas and all the 
rest yeah. of it. Yeah. Firmly believing that um, you know a country, can't, you know a state-run uh, organisation is just going to be inherently inefficient. Well, um, look at the situation we're in now, um, and w- what. It's even more fundamental than profits for me, James. Uh, profits would be a nice little bit of extra cream here. What we're talking about is the basic infrastructure of a country that is not owned, run, managed by that country for the benefit of its citizens. And that, to me, is lunacy. You know, when we're talking in terms well, the, of... Like, the, 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 counter, Chinese, the counter would be that they're operating it as a, as a profit-making company. Um, uh, 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 putting the interests of passengers becomes uh, almost natural because the more the more the more you look after passengers, the more money you okay. will make, and you, you reject that's, that. That's fine unless you've got something like a, a very rural bus route run by a private company that simply doesn't make any money on that bus route. So that either yeah. either that. So there's no money to be made, and there's a little old lady who can't get into so, town every exactly. week. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we've so seen that happen. Removed, yeah, or it gets subsidised by the state. Where's the sense in that? So if, if someone's making a profit out of something that's being subsidised by the state, it's it's palpably yes. absurd. So the, why do you think yes. the story isn't bigger? Why do you think there's an awful lot of people listening to this programme who are already reeling from the numbers with regard to railway oh. are now going to reel again when I tell them that a Spanish government-owned um, company, Iberdrola, yes. uh, owns Scottish Power. 600 million quid taken out in profits last yes. time of counting. Yes, sim- simply because... And, and by the way, those profits could still be generated maybe at a slightly less level, but they would all be ploughed back into the operation of that piece of infrastructure. They wouldn't be uh, paid out in dividends or to shareholders or to large salaries. This is why they've got to keep immigration on the table, isn't it? So, so exactly. as long as they keep immigration on the table, all of the real reasons why our infrastructure is crumbling, why yes. money is being taken out of the country, because it's 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 uncomfortable exactly. for them to say we need to renationalize this subject is not you you're the first person that i've heard in the media in the mainstream media to actually discuss this this subject is deliberately kept under wraps i've got to say as well as a slight side issue uh, with the whole scottish independence thing uh, nationalization of certain industries like the rail network in scotland is a key part of what a, a nationalized scotland would look like so we've already kind of gone ahead a wee bit we've, we've had a wee bit of enlightenment here we can see that uh, you know this fragmented rail system where you can't buy a ticket to go from one ticket that'll take you from the north of scotland to this to the south of england yeah. you can't do it uh, so um to, to me, it, it needs so, to be uh, broadcast more. It needs well, to be well, we'll more do, we'll do, we'll do our bit. I mean, yeah. just just in terms of facts, just putting it out there. These are numbers. These are not opinions. These are not. We need to get our country back, or we need to control our borders. These are hundreds of millions of pounds going into state-owned foreign companies, coming out of the pockets of British commuters and passengers and energy energy users. It, 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 that perhaps part of Corbyn's appeal, which regular listeners will know, has been a, something of a puzzle to me. Is 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 that sense you have now when I tell you this stuff of it just being bleeding obvious that something should change and yet British politics for the last 20 years arguably has just been variations on a similar theme Corbyn his supporters keep arguing and I can neither confirm nor deny because I've never met the bloke um, he, he seems to recognize that things can change and this would be a great example of that if it turns out to be true but I need people to, to, to remind me why um, uh, it's not a, a no-brainer William is in Finchley William what would you like to say Good day to you. How are you today? I'm, I'm great, thanks. What's on your mind? What's on my mind is we can't afford nationalisation. We're still not even close to paying off the national credit card bill that Jeremy Cor- Trotsky Corbyn and his Labour colleagues left off with in 2010. And we had a massive credit card bill under the previous Labour administration in '79, where everything was run by the government. The government was the economy. And in 79, we had that massive winter of discontent. Why on earth would you want to put Jeremy Corbyn in charge of running anything? Well, I I mean, the short answer would be the the hundreds of millions of pounds I've just identified as making their way to the French, Spanish, Dutch and German government and the Hong Kong government could instead be going into our own treasury and and paying off the credit card bill, as you refer to it. You're talking about hundreds of millions of pounds, is that correct? Yes. Our annual budget deficit is 50 billion in other words yes so 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 why would sending money to germany spain hong kong and holland be a good idea well you just said it's a hundred hundreds of millions that's less than one percent but 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 that's the the question the question is simple 
Why would sending hundreds of millions of pounds to foreign governments for running our railways be a good approach to a massive national debt? I just want to understand. Well, I, okay, I, well, it's not the question, it's a question. My question to you is... It doesn't work like that. You, you, I, it? it doesn't work like that. I want, I want you to explain to me how sending hundreds of millions of pounds to foreign governments that own railway companies in this country and energy companies and and you can you can add some zeros to that if you want when you start looking at the energy companies i just want to understand i appreciate it might not be a massive pay down on the debt that you describe but how can it be a good idea to send it to foreign governments okay but, hang on a second so you you have an idea it's an incredibly simple government. question here is millions and millions and millions of pounds that is raised by British railway journeys and British energy consumers. Where do we send the money? Do we send it to our treasury or the German, Dutch, French and Hong Kong treasuries? Just explain to me why the second option is a good idea. I'm, I'm hearing a hatred towards foreign investment. You, you, do you drive Pardon? a British car or a foreign car? I, 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 I drive a Volvo. Okay, that's not made in Britain. Why are you spending money on foreign assets? What, what, pardon? The, 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 the VAT kind of on my car has all gone to the Treasury. Every penny of petrol that I pay goes to the British Treasury. You need to explain to me why it would be better for Britain for me to have bought my car in Germany and given all the money to the German government, William. But let's not, let's not indulge in whataboutery. You're too clever for that. Just explain to me how it's good for the British national debt to be sending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of pounds of money raised by British passengers on British railways and buying British energy from British energy companies. We're sending all that money to Germany, France, Holland and Hong Kong. I just need you to remind me why that's a good thing in the context of the debt that you've described so articulately. Well, first of all, uh, I, I challenged you on what I suggested might be a, a xenophobic uh, streak in your question. No, I, I, okay, I'm, I'm a xenophobe. Now answer my question. How is it a good idea to send all this money to the German Treasury, the Dutch Treasury, the French Treasury, and the Hong Kong Treasury instead of the British Treasury? Just to explain, in the context of the debt you've described so poetically, how is it a good thing? If I've got a big debt and it's with the Halifax, how is it a good idea for me to give lots of money to, I don't know, save the children? Uh, well, I'm going to go back to your question about why we're spending money going to foreign... Well, you can, you can do that after you've, after you've answered the first question. How is it good for the British national debt, for all of this money raised from British consumers, to be going to foreign governments, William? Well, we, I've already answered that question. No, you, you know, haven't, mate, I promise. I, I, OK, I, I'll, I'll have another go. I, I think what you're getting at is not about <laughs> whether it's going to contribute to the debt, <sighs> I'm taking the premise of your point about the national debt, and I'm wondering how you are going to explain to me why it's a good way to pay down the British debt by sending hundreds of millions of pounds to the German, French, Dutch, and Hong Kong treasuries. Just, just, just come on, it's but, not, it can't be that hard. You're, uh, you're, uh, if I may say, James, you're conflating. If you're allowed, I hadn't mentioned the debt, my friend. You, you rang in to mention the debt. So for the final time, I, 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 how is sending hundreds of millions of pounds to the French government in return for running British rail routes, the German government in return for running British energy companies, the Hong Kong government in return for running both, and the French government, not to mention the stake it has in Renault and I think in Peugeot as well. So just for a British, average British punter who's not as clever as you, William, explain to them why it's a really good idea for the money he pays for his railway ticket to go to Angela Merkel's government rather than Theresa May's? Well, first of all, if you are choosing to have businesses, services in this country run well... It's a simple well, question about one railway ticket. Why is it a good I'm idea not, for not, that I'm money not. to go to Angela Merkel's I'm government not, instead I, of I, Theresa I, May's? I, I, James, I tried to answer your question, but you've interrupted me about five times. If you try to answer it, I won't interrupt you. So this money answer, is going to Germany. Answer, How is I'm that good answer. for Britain? It's good for Britain if the quality of the services being received through those contracts is better than if Jeremy Corbyn was running it. That's it's good for answer. Britain if the quality of the services... I'm talking about Theresa May's government, William. Well, it doesn't matter who his government is. What matters is, <laughs> if you're paying for a service <laughs> that has been privatised and you're getting a high quality of service, like, for example, potentially in the telephone sector, you, you mis misremembered when the last... Bless you. Uh, uh, so just, just finally, because I know you hate being interrupted, it's a good idea for British railway passengers' ticket money to go to Germany instead of Britain because... Who, 
who gets paid to a degree is irrelevant. Okay. Well, well it, it kind of isn't if you're going to ring up and talk about the national debt. Where the money goes to the British Treasury or the German Treasury is the central point that you made. But I, I appreciate that, you know, it can be a little challenging when you find yourself live on the radio. It's 11.19, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I am 45 years old. For me, nationalisation was always a dirty word, um, and I don't understand why anymore. Chiefly chiefly because so much of our previously nationalized industry is now owned by government just not our government so if other governments can own it and, and earn a significant crust why do we still cling to the notion that our government could not run some companies which leads us to one of the things apparently in jeremy corbyn's looming manifesto which is that energy firms railways and the royal mail would be re-nationalized uh, you have I, I guess it's tribal rhetoric isn't it because the question you have to answer for, for all of the throwbacks to the 70s and the winter of discontent and the rubbish piling up in the streets the question isn't whether or not we can do it the question is why can they do it why can the german government do it but we can't. That's what I need. That's what I need to understand. Lee is in Hemel Hempstead. Lee, what would you like to say? I just want to say that no matter what you say, Labour are dishonest, and they will at some point use nationalisation as a weapon in politics. There's no ifs or buts about it. Maybe not at the beginning, but in the end they will. And my argument is, when Labour turned around and said that they were going to bring it back to the UK, yeah, privatise it but make sure the shares can only be bought by individuals in the UK, then maybe they might have a point, but until that point... Just run, run, that, run, that, run that by me again. Well, if they, if Labour if yeah. brought the companies, like I said, right, we're taking, we're bringing it and nationalise it, we're bringing it all back in, everything, the whole lot, back into the UK, right? We, we, we admit that we will probably use it as a political weapon, so what we'll do is we will reprivatise it, but instead of going to private companies, the only people that could bid on it are people from the UK. But, but it's already privatised. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. What I'm you saying, can't re-privatise something it that's back, currently privatised. Bring it in, bring it back into the UK. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean, do you think, Lee? Privatise it. Sorry? What does that mean, do you think? The managements that are currently being paid and, and uh, run by, for example, a, a German-owned company, when you say bring it back into the UK, what do you think that means? I mean, stop money going out of the UK. I'm not, I so you stop no, paying the management? I've got no argument, with you. I've got no, argument no, no disagreement with, with your argument about money going out of the UK. You're absolutely spot on, you bit the name. I'm a floating voter. Well, uh, no, OK, I, I just need to be clear on what you think you're saying. So you, you stop the money going out of the UK, so you stop paying the, the, the people running the railways? You bring, you, bring the, you bring it all back into the UK, yeah. and then you reprivatise it, but the shares... Only get sold to British people, so we withdraw from all international stock markets. Then, oh, if that, you're the one, you're the one sitting there saying that all the money's going out of the country. I'm just trying to come up with a, a, a rational idea of what we may be able to do. Okay, so, well, good, good luck with that. But just, just in terms of only, in terms of only selling shares to British people, would that be British residents or, or British? I mean, what, if, I, if I was British and I lived in France, would I be allowed to buy shares? If you, it's up to you. If the money goes, no, it's back your it's your British, plan, mate. If the money I, I, goes back into British pensions. But do you know what the stock market is? I'm not really interested in that. What I'm interested okay, in. Okay, but this is your rational suggestion of how we could redistribute shares in 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 the how, most. How how else are we going to do it? Because I don't trust Labour. Okay. I don't trust Labour at all. You say one, you say that you will do something, but you will always use it for a political gain. In the end, maybe not. Jeremy Corbyn, but down the line yes. you use that against the Tories in what some way or not. I've seen you. Th I've seen it before. You can see it in America. Can you, can you, I, I, I don't want to sound rude, mate. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. I'm saying that we. Let's do. I'll tell you what we can do to help me. Is examples? Give me an example of the sort of thing you mean. What I'm saying is, if you were bringing it, you keep you keep saying all these profits going out the UK, out out to different countries. But I'm, I can agree with you. I completely agree with you. So what will we do about it? I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm no expert. I'm just giving. Oh, don't, an opinion. don't don't I'm not don't do I'm yourself not down, Lee. City man. Yeah. I'm not a city man. I don't know. All I'm trying to do is come up with reasonable, rational ideas. Now, but I'm you haven't. You, you've come up. You've come up with an absolute pie of bonkersness. Why have I? Well, I've just explained to you that even even at a cursory glance, your your suggestion your suggestion would no okay. 
How do we remove the politics from it? How do we stop How do we remove the politics from 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 privatization from nationalization? Well, you, how do we remove the politics from it? How how do you remove government from government decisions is what you're asking me? What I'm saying is how I, do you I, stop I'm going I'll tell you what. So let me give you an example. Uh, yeah, go on. From what I remember of the 70s, from I wasn't I was born in 1978. From what I I'm not saying nationalization. So we're drawing on 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 78 and 79, your memories of 78 and 79. Yeah, all I'm saying, from what I remember of, of it, was that the unions want, w w wanted to rid of the Tories. And all they, what they were doing, they were, they were using, right, national, like the rails. Look at the railways. Every time there's an, like, uh, um, say, London Rail, what's at the moment, every time there's an issue that they have with the Tories... We, we, we'll check in on Lee. Um, sort of near to bedtime. Make sure he's okay. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The question is, is a, well, I thought it was a relatively straightforward one. Perhaps I have to go back to the drawing board um, and, and work out why I missed the possibility of withdrawing government from government decisions and Britain from all forms of international stock market or, or, or share dealing. The question is, why is nationalisation a dirty word? I think very unintentionally, Lee just provided us with the most powerful answer yet. It is probably the dirtiest word in British politics, or at least it was until immigration came along. Nationalisation. Absolutely anathema. Absolutely anathema. It's awful. You can't trust governments to run companies. And everyone takes that as gospel. And I have, all my life actually. You can't trust governments to, 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 to run companies. And then you learn, of all the companies that are owned in part or in full by foreign governments that are running our <laughs> formerly <laughs> formerly nationalised industries. Dutch, French, German, even Hong Kong. And, and we're talking about epic sums of money. What, why can the German government or the French government successfully have stakes in railway routes or indeed in car manufacturing companies, in automotive industries? And our government can't. It, this is Thatcher, I think. This is the same as that thing about councils not being allowed to make a profit out of, um, uh, out of property investments, a law that she brought in. And it was, for, for good or for ill, I'm not here to make a judgment about it. I'm just here to understand why we are where we are. For good or ill, the idea was that the market and business will set everything. There's no such thing as society. Is a misconstrued quote that she did say, but not quite in the context that her critics sometimes... Uh, contend, but but it would be everything would be set by 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 economics, by supply and demand, no intervention. It was the big sticking point, wasn't it, between her and Michael Heseltine when he felt the British government had a role to play in the future of Westland, and Thatcher and Leon Britton um, felt that the uh, the market should decide where that helicopter company ended up. I think I lean personally more to Heseltinean issues on this and that that's odd maybe i think that's what the fellow in finchley was uh, alluding to when he called me xenophobic and that I, I think we should actually have measures in place to keep as much money in britain as possible but but globalization means that a british company isn't really good enough it needs to be the british government you want as much money making its way from the pocket of the british railway passenger into the coffers of the british government at the moment we only get the vat the German government makes more. If you catch a train to Kings Lynn today, the German government will make more out of that journey than the British government will. Especially if you leave VAT off it. You know, if it's a business journey and you're not paying VAT, you're claiming it back. How can that be right? Oh, because governments can't run railways. No, hang on. The German government's running it effectively. This is, for me, the big ideological divide between Britain and the rest of the European continent i think i think but that that sounds a bit portentous so stick it in the fridge where are we going next wembley or harrow it's a uh, north london bun fight reggie's in harrow reggie what would you like to say how you doing james all good mate. Um, i just i just wanted to give a different perspective from it um it's not quite as straightforward as just the money just going straight from ticket to um no i'm sure it isn't i'm glad you're here to, to help um they actually have to bid for these franchises and within the bid, they have to actually state exactly how much money and how much revenue they will um, they, they determine to make. And within that, they put in um, several things like uh, updating the trains, investing in the lines, you know, the kind of things that you probably wouldn't see or 
there wouldn't be so much of a need to do under it because being, of the competition the nature of competitive tendering means that well, yeah, but, but, <laughs> you're right and it's a very important thing to add to the conversation competitive tendering many people believe adds to efficiencies and, and adds Definitely. to effectiveness but it also and I don't know if this is an elephant in the room of your analysis it also it, the whole practice is contingent upon the fact that there's a pile of money left over at the end that goes to people who've done nothing but invest but that surely that's still a good thing because we're seeing well no because that pile of money left over at the end could go to the treasury but we wouldn't see that kind of money if it was being run nationally because that competitive edge wouldn't be there for example on the east coast the government have actually got three different companies running on the same line all competing for business all who put in bids to determine and and and, and all paying dividends to their shareholders and profits back to foreign governments that's right but would we be able to get those kind of margins through the bids if it was just nationalized there wouldn't be any competition that's 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 the that's the second question isn't it so once we've once we've accepted that nationalization isn't necessarily a dirty word then you have to look at how it became one and you're providing part of that answer it became a dirty word partly because people fail to believe or refuse to believe or rightly don't believe that you can remove elements of competition from a process and not damage the service that you're receiving that's exactly it. I mean, yeah, I've been in the it's a strong point. For 20 years now. Um, so I was there initially when it was BR. And yeah, it was great. We've done a good job in delivering the service. However, um, I currently work for a privatized company. And um, <laughs> the marketing that is involved now in, in order to get as many bums on seats. And they make it clear to us that, look, we are competing against X amount of um, other franchises. We're, we're currently even looking at getting people off trains onto trains. That's the kind of thing you would have probably seen. Um, um, but other, other, I mean, I, I would suggest to you that other companies can do it. Other countries, I beg your pardon, can do it. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's a need. When I, I mean, I do travel abroad a lot. When you look at France and stuff, because of just the, the the infrastructure aspect of it, people have got no choice but to travel by train. They don't seem to be traveling by train in France is a su is a vastly superior experience to traveling by yeah, train in Britain, yeah, and that's nationalised. Germany, Ireland, Italy, Japan, yeah. Spain. Yeah, but they don't need to push for that. Argentina. We do here. <laughs> It can it can be done, I, I, and and that's yeah. the legacy of the seventies. And 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 yeah. the poor fellow before the news, who, who who draws on his memories of being born in nineteen seventy eight. Um, he, he, he's bought into that, and so have I. Historically, we can't do it. That's why we don't renationalise because we made a mess of it last time. We will never be able to make a success of it in the future. And I don't think we'll see the kind of profits that are coming out just through the franchise fee. But I, I don't mind if the profits halve as long as they all go to the treasury instead of to the German treasury, the well, Bundesbank, the be Bundesbank. As much money as possible back into our coffers. Yeah, and at the moment it's zero. What we want, even if it means but at the moment it's zero, mate. At the moment it's all go your your company's profits all go to shareholders. It's not zero. What happens? No, because you pay you pay for the franchise. So so exactly. it's a question of what what you do with the excess. I, I'm glad you were listening. I, I finally somebody not swallowing the Kool Aid of renationalisation who um, actually knows what they're talking about. Uh, <laughs> third time lucky. Sarah's in Wembley. Sarah, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Um, I'd like to talk about water, actually. Water, there's no competition with water. It's the French or nobody. They own all the French. They, the French own all the water companies. And they also have got fracking coming over here. French companies are bringing fracking, or started. And they use billions of gallons of clean water. So I'd like to know how much the French uh, companies shareholders are getting from the fracking that the, the it's not mystery hour mate it's not mystery hour until 12 o'clock i don't know how much the french shareholders are getting from fracking fracking well exactly i, I better be careful how i pronounce things but i the water I, I, well, i've lost my track now yeah the water all the water companies are french in this country there's no competition so if they're selling water i don't think that's true they're not all french are they yeah there's no competition. You, well, you, you keep saying that. It doesn't make it true. The companies that supply your water, apart from the one that's doing it. But anyway, yeah. being yeah. that the, seems that seems the, legit. The water, which is very precious now, because the rate, we, we're going to be very short of water in the future. Oh, cheer up. I'd, I'd like. Well, I'd like to know how much. Well, I don't know. Why are you asking me? I'm just Jimmy from the block. I want you to, to find out, Jimmy. Well, well, you got, you got get yourself a flipping Google or something. I'm not here to serve you like a like a sort of information butler. I wouldn't have it on Duke. I wanted to know... Well, all I want to know is that the British public are not being ripped off with their water because French shareholders...
shareholder, a French, of selling water to the French fracking companies. Um, as I say, they're going to use billions, and, and we could easily be short of water the next 10 to 12 years. And if we've got French people owning the water companies and putting the prices, yeah. we're already paying for the nose for water. And, and we've got the shale gas, which is wonderful, but it's a fossil fuel. And if, if it comes to being short of gas or short of water, seriously short of water, I know which I'd rather. So it, we could end up paying a fortune in, in um, water charges with no competition, and the French companies can easily sell the, the, the French um, companies from the fracking. Uh, no, yep. bear in mind, France... No, I'm going to crack on. Do you mind? Is that all right? Oh, you made some excellent points, but I'm going to crack on. I'm going to frack on, if that's all right with you. I'm glad you said it, not me. <laughs> okay, then, bye. God bless, Sarah. Um, Frederick's in Golders Green. Frederick, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Yeah, I, am, I would say the reason why privatisation in the UK is a dirty word is because of the unions. Nationalisation. Nationalisation yes. is, is a dirty word. It's because of the unions. In countries like Denmark, Germany, the unions are progressive. They support innovation and change, and they support their workers to change with those progresses. I, I, I don't know how much I don't know how much you've been listening to, but the, the the point is that the companies running the railways and the energy companies here are in large part owned by foreign governments, and they're making massive profits with the British workforce and British trade unions in place. Yeah, but that is the same thing with they are providing a service, but that's the same thing with our pension funds. Our pension funds. Buy is it a full moon? To, is it a full moon tonight? It was, was it yesterday? I flipping knew it. Every time. Every single time. Here's the thing, mate. The reason you, you can't really say that nationalisation doesn't work here because of our unions is because state-owned companies making enormous profits in this com country today are operating with British unions. No. When okay. the UK government... James, when the UK government owns a um, company, the unions take control. So look at Southern Rail, mate. That's a perfect example of when the unions are standing against progressive change. That any but by progressive change, you mean reducing jobs? Reducing jobs or driving efficiency. See, that's another argument change. for me, and the opposite of what you're saying. I think as automation comes closer, we as a people, as a species, let alone as a, as a, as a nation, have to look at the possibility of sustaining jobs that do not necessarily make sense under pure capitalism. In the same way that in Switzerland they pay money to keep the countryside looking pretty, even though it's not agriculturally efficient. We don't. What, if everything is done by a robot, Frederick, if we've got driverless trains and no guards, and we've got checkouts, who 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 actually earns a living? James, if you do not evolve, you go extinct. So you cannot fight. But that's not true, you. Frederick. Either you you you, you, you do not you. become extinct if you don't evolve. That that that's both biologically and intellectually bogus. But if this if workers do not upskill, they become redundant. Is the reality of the job? Okay. So on with the on with the robots. No, on with privatization and human beings doing more efficient jobs. Yes. It's not the reality, mate. Yeah, um, you got you got me. Eleven forty-five. Where I, I, I don't, I hesitate to make sort of sweeping observations. But you look at the political state of the of the of the world at the moment, or our little corner of the world, and our, our sort of nearest neighbours, both geographically and culturally. And, and I think we could all agree there's a sense that something that things don't have to be like this, whether it's a vote for Brexit or a vote for Donald Trump. That the, the people who weren't motivated by blind prejudice and ignorance on those sides were motivated by a genuine belief that things could be better than they currently are. You had Donald Trump very cynically exploiting that feeling by telling people that he would make things better when he had, I don't think, any real intention of doing so. But the, the notion that things could be better than they are. And then you come to Britain in particular and ask the question, why? Why aren't they better? What, what the politicians... I mean, off the top of your head, can you think of anything that is in the mainstream media-approved narrative about how Britain could be improved that doesn't involve being meaner to foreigners? I can't think of anything. Well, what's a good policy for making Britain better? Well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have fewer foreigners. That will definitely make Britain better. Most of the evidence suggests that it won't, but it's a really powerful argument. And when Jeremy Corbyn comes up with an idea that might make Britain better, gets laughed out of court, partly because the competence and the, and, the, and the delivery of the package is so poor, but possibly, his supporters would suggest, because the vested interests who want us to carry on chomping on about immigration, because that way we won't notice that our wages are um, being controlled by our bosses, not by, <laughs> not by the Romanian fellow over the road. He doesn't set what you, what you earn. Your boss does. And... 
more interventionist government and more nationalisation would give government more control over things like wages and more revenue that currently makes its way into the coffers of companies that are actually owned by foreign governments. And the argument is that governments can't run companies. Fascinating. Nigel's in Brighouse in West Yorkshire. Nigel, what would you like to say? Um, good morning to you, Jay. Nice to talk to you. Likewise, well, Nigel. Just well, on about this privatisation nonsense and nationalisation. <laughs> I think I spoke this a long time ago, but about this before to you. What people seem to forget when they talk about nationalisation, this government don't like that word for the simple reason they they spin it like Shane Warne can spin a cricket ball because <laughs> what they do between 1948 and 1995, when n most of national, when most of our utilities were nationalised railways coal board and all that. They were in power that time, James, 80% of that. No, and, the, yes. and, and, and they never mentioned this, right? And what they do, you see, they'll blame somebody else when they cock it up and then they go on to... <laughs> mind, you, mind your French, Nigel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> then right. they go on to Pontius pilot mode. It's not my responsibility. Yeah. My industry are the railways, right? 61, they got Beijing to come in to sort it all out under a, under a transport minister who had, who had his, his money in roads. Well, this is Chomsky, isn't it? And, and he's not exactly covering himself in glory at the moment in America, but I think Noam Chomsky's theory is that, that a right-wing government defunds and demoralises a public, a public sector Correct. institution until it reaches such a stage that they can say to the public, the only way we can fix this is by selling it to, the, to our mates, actually, in the private sector. Well, that's, that's probably the easiest way of saying it. But if you look into the, into the figures and all the history of it, I work with British Rail. Yeah. And British Rail does that exact. Because what they're doing today, British, this, the private railway today is no different to British Rail because this government are giving money to the companies. And yes. also, these companies, James, don't own one train. It's all leased off. Yes. So, you know, I'm only a simple 61-year-old Yorkshireman, right? Yeah. But the thing There's is, nothing simple about Yorkshiremen, Nigel, in I, my experience. The thing, <laughs> thing is, James, I get a bit fed up when I hear about the Tories. Spin, 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 spin. We never, we, we've never had this so far, this election, as I know, a simple opinion poll so far nationally. I, 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 I've never seen one. Yet on Facebook, you'd think, not being funny, Corbyn's going to walk in here. Well, it depends. It's a self-selecting sample on Facebook, of course, but, but we, shall, we, shall, we shall see what transpires. I think, from my point of view, I, I resonate, what, what, lots of what you say resonates with me, because I speak every day to people for whom these very simple, clear messages simply don't, don't appear on their radar ever. For example, the, the people who are absolutely convinced that governments can't run railways because, you know, the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mail and Rupert Murdoch said so, just not aware of the fact that foreign governments run huge swathes of our railways and take all the profits yeah back to their own countries. It's incredible. You say two things for our government. We've got other people. Go on. One, as you said a long time ago, this government loves state ownership, providing it's not state owned. <laughs> I, I, I think I nicked that off someone else, but it's that a great line. Well, <laughs> right. and, and, and if you think about it sensibly, this government, right, they'll spin and spin and spin and spin until the cows come home. Because it's, what Pontius Pilate, Richard Beecher, Richard Beecher never shut one railway down. He might have put a report in, but he'd gone after, before railways were slow, you know, cut, cut and cut. I've got one problem with what you said. Go on then. Why, why did you pick Shane Warne? Shouldn't you have picked Azim Rafiq? <laughs> well, I think, well, I could pick this kid who's going Yorkshire now, it was, it was a good spin, but Warne's the main one people would... I know, but I wanted a Yorkshire spinner. I don't know why Shane Warne gets the nod. I'll give you one then. Johnny Wardle. All right, you can take Johnny. I'll see your Johnny Wardle. I'll raise you Azim Rafiq. <laughs> have a great day, Nigel. Katie is in Witten. Katie, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Okay. Great show. I That's think right. you've made my point while I've been holding oh, sorry. on, which is a little frustrating. Oh, I, I must be so annoying, especially if it was brilliant. Uh, well, <laughs> it's just why are people assuming that if we renationalise, it will go back to the way it was in the 70s? If, as you said, other governments are running their rail networks very well... We're kind of talking ourselves down. Oh, I love it. We can't do it. Oh, you are brilliant. This is what I think probably has to happen next in, in politics, is that the the kind of the, 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 the evidence-based people have to nick at least some of the tactics of the, of the nativists and the non-evidence-based people. And that one would be one of the things worth nicking. So you're talking our country down when you say they couldn't run a railway. Yeah. You're talking down the British government, you, you, you Ramona. No, no, hang on. You saboteur. <laughs> Crush the saboteur. How, so, oh, I see. So the German government can run a British railway, but you think that the British government wouldn't be up to the task? What sort of a treacherous so-and-so are you? But they'll point you back to the 1970s, because nothing ever changes, apparently. And progress is impossible. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing ever changes, except the money, oddly, always makes its way 
into precisely the same places. I love that argument. I can, do you mind if I nick it? I nick sure. it back. I mean, you said I got there first, but I don't think I did. I, that notion of talking the country down. So we can't run railways. We can't renationalize stuff. You're talking the country down. Yeah. Oh, I love it. And, uh, and I tell you what, I love it for two reasons. The first is that, at first glance, it's a brilliant observation. The second is it's 11.57, so if anyone's qualified to punch a massive great hole in it, we're probably not going to have time to take the call. <laughs> <laughs> Casey, have a great day. Alex is in South Woodford. Alex, what would you like to say? Hello, I'd like to say that nationalisation um, can work in this country. And I think uh, the purpose of nationalisation when it comes to trains is for the government to pass the buck. Um, yes. Here's what's interesting. On a, on a national level, we have these train operating companies that they don't even invest they don't, they don't buy the train carriages they don't buy any signals or tracks but I they're going to spend as little as they can get away with spending because they keep everything that's left over correct correct and i think they are used by the government to basically be able to pass the buck i think the, 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 the government in this country sees trains as a vote loser when they work the government's just doing its job when it doesn't work they lose votes but here's what is interesting in London, they found another way, and that is to have a directly elected mayor mm. and make him in charge of transport. So here is a tongue-in-cheek uh, thought experiment. What about if we had a national mayor for railways who was directly elected? You could call it the Minister of Transport, couldn't you? Or, or you'd want an actual minister, a directly related minister of... Uh of railways. Well, I don't know if you have to go that far, but that's the kind of blue sky thinking that I, for one, applaud, Alex, because that makes you a true patriot acting in the national interest instead of one of these dreadful traitors talking the country down by claiming that the British government would somehow be incapable of running a railway or indeed a bath. And one, one tiny point, the government doesn't charge BAT on train fares, so they actually get even less does it not? Are you uh, sure no, about that? No. Yeah, absolutely. I double checked it. Well, I can't have people coming Crazy. on this program double checking things. Honestly, it's going to be a bit embarrassed to <laughs> the rest of us. But that means that I was absolutely right when I suggested that the German government is going to make more out of a railway journey than the British government is. Correct. Happy days. Um, I made some progress there. I enjoyed that. It's, it's, it's nice to sort of have a conversation. I think that might be the way forward for us in the next few weeks as the election comes closer, is just to sort of challenge the, 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 the presumptions, like me thinking that nationalisation is a dirty word and, and working out why and then wondering whether it should be. I